Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Dr. Chris Bates. I am a research and analytics director for TPP. Um, so I work with Frank Esther, who gave the keynote yesterday. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk to you, we haven't set this up, me and AJ, but I'm going to talk to you about some of the applications of, of data, some of the applications of that, that streaming data, that very quick data, and also that, that sort of big data approach uh, with real world examples of what we're doing in analytics now and, and where, the, where the field is going. Um, but also across some key areas, some key areas that are now becoming uh, more important to, to EHR vendors and to, to providers and even to governments. Uh, so my background is in mathematics. I was an academic mathematician. Uh, I've been working in digital health now for, for over 15 years uh, in software as a software developer and a data scientist. And as, a, and as an organization, TPP, we're very, very, we're active in research, active in data, active in anal analytics. And we work very closely with hospitals, with universities, government agencies and ministries to try and use that data to answer key questions. So I really want to talk about how we can use the data uh, for these, to, to improve outcomes for people, to increase, uh, uh, to increase healthcare, to give better healthcare, increase efficiencies, and reduce some of those inequalities. The areas I want to focus on, and it'll be a quite a quick tour through these, are AI and machine learning, but real examples of, of, of how that's helping in healthcare, trusted research environments, novel data sources, how important scale and scope is, and then probably most importantly, actionable analytics, because, because we, if we, if we've got to do this to try and make healthcare better. If we're not um, using these analytics to try and drive performance, then it's all for nothing. And, and, and I'm, I mean, as an organization, we remember, you know, three or four years ago when Dr. Dr. Datuk Dr. Zul, who was the former health minister in Malaysia, was launching their national EMR program, and he said, we're never gonna be judged on technology. I'm going to be judged on the quality of, of, of outcome performance. How do I make healthcare better? And I think in this field of digital health, that's really important for us to always remember. And on that point, what are those ch challenges? Whenever we're doing analytics work, we need to be thinking about challenges. And we have lots of shared challenges uh, across the world. You know, and we all know, as AJ's just highlighted, the rise of non-communicable diseases and aging populations um, and multimorbidity, the increase in cancer burden and in cancer incidence around the world, something that's challenging all health systems, uh, the rise of infectious disease and the, you know, the emergence of new diseases, putting massive healthcare pressures on systems. How do we use our data and our platforms to do a better job to tackle endemic problems like TV, hepatitis, HIV and diarrheal disease, but also those emerging threats, uh, COVID as we've seen, highly pathogenic influenza. How do we use data to do better workforce, to manage our workforce better and relieve some of those workforce pressures? There's not a country in the world, as Frank said yesterday, that, that doesn't have a shortage of nurses, doctors and midwives. We need to be able to reduce that burden. How do we tackle increasing healthcare costs, both out-of-pocket payment, insurance payment, and, and the burden it places on society for universal health coverage? And then, as the Minister uh, of Health said yesterday, we know that models are shifting towards patient-centric models and towards new models of care and models of care that are based around the patient, based around technology, uh, based around changing science. But of course, that means we need to be able to influence policy. And we need data to be able to do that. So the complex times, um, and we need big data uh, approaches, in, in, in our view, to try and solve those. I just want to give you some context about the sort of scale of data I'm talking about um, here at TPP, working in, in, uh, in uh, collaboration with these organizations, as I've said. So, so we're active across 25 different healthcare settings, so across that continuum of care. So that's everything from uh, emergency department, uh, tertiary hospitals, uh, down to primary care, community care, and then you know, care at home and smartphone apps for patients. So in all those settings, we're very, very active. Uh, we have our systems in about 8,000 organizations worldwide. Uh, that spans from the UK to China. Uh, we're active in, in Malaysia. We recently went live uh, in uh, the new hospital for KPJ in Malaysia. Uh, but also in the Middle East and the Caribbean. So we work around the world and we have a, a centralized cloud-based platform. So we're all cloud-based and we host the records for over 52 million patients. And that's detailed electronic medical records. So that's all diagnoses, symptoms, lab tests uh, from cradle to grave. So really, really rich, powerful source of data. I'm gonna just show you examples of what we've done with that. I'll start with AI, machine learning and the key aspects of decision support, population health, and, and helping the workforce with some real examples. And I'll start with ovarian cancer. Now this is a, 
on purpose, actually, Southeast Asia and, and Northern Europe have the highest uh, mortality rates for ovarian cancer anywhere in the world. It's a notoriously difficult thing to diagnose, and the clinicians in the room will know that. It presents as many, many other conditions, but if you look there to the, to the left-hand side, if you don't catch that at the right stage, if you catch that at stage three or four, which 80% of cases in, in Southeast Asia are caught at stage three or four, then your mortality outcomes are very poor, your prognosis is poor. If we can pull that left and start to spot people at stage one or two, then the survival rates are far, far better. So the challenge was set to us in the UK uh, by the Prime Minister at the time, which was uh, to try and improve ovarian cancer diagnoses. And the, and the approach we took, um, working with our clinicians, working with uh, GPs, was to use machine learning to do this and to use this, what we would say is a, a multimodal approach. So we weren't, you know, traditionally lots and lots of AI in healthcare is focused on imaging. But imaging is far too late in this situation if you want to pull that, that diagnosis further left, you know, towards primary care. So here we developed an algorithm based on symptoms, diagnoses, uh, blood tests, history, family history, uh, even taking in some genomic information uh, that could be recorded on the record. To, to try and predict at the point of care whether a clinician had, uh, whether a patient had an undiagnosed tumour, an ovarian cancer tumour. We worked very closely with clinicians, and I think that's important. We weren't trying to work against clinicians. We were working with them in collaboration to try and better reflect clinical practice and to use all those data items to try and reflect how clinicians actually work using multiple sources of information to make that decision. Where we got to is an algorithm which 50% of the time recommends appropriate testing before the GP would have done. So again, working with GPs and putting it in a situation which basically gave them a nudge. And there was two ways that this happens. One is it would give them a nudge inside clinical practice during a consultation. But more importantly, the thing that they really liked was the idea that they could have a retrospective screen, which would tell them for the list of patients they were managing, it may be 10, 20, 30,000 patients, the small list who are most at risk of having an undiagnosed tumor for ovarian cancer. We also did it for uh, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and bowel cancer, and we get the same results. So what it means is we've used those millions of electronic health rec records, anonymized and ethically available for research, to develop this algorithm and then put it into clinical practice. Another example, and this is actually Israeli work that was done. It's a fantastic piece of work, but we've been able to replicate exactly the same thing on another data set, which again gives you massive confidence that something going on here. And it's just an unconventional way of trying to solve a problem. In that first example, we're using if any, any machine learning uh, AI specialists are in the room, it was all labeled data. So we know when people have got ovarian cancer. In this situation, the question is different. The question is, should we be using the same standardized HbA1c targets, so uh, glucose control targets, for all of our type 2 diabetic patients? And the answer is no. When you've got big data at that scale, and you can start to look and use the machine to spot patterns, what we spot is three distinct clusters of patients. So clusters of patients who respond better to different targets in terms of getting complications of diabetes, uh, complications from diabetes. So kidney problems, eye problems, foot problems, for example. There are people who have stable, uh, stable trajectories, descending trajectories and ascending trajectories. And actually by giving them individualized targets, you can get better results uh, for their diabetic control. So it's a, a, on a journey towards precision medicine using this electronic medical record data. If we push that further into the rare disease uh, arena, again, this is an unsupervised machine learning approach to, to getting relevant faster diagnoses for rare disease. Now, rare disease is when you actually aggregate them up, there's a, you know, place a huge burden on, on, on healthcare systems and a huge burden on people. Um, and 5% you know, of the world population is affected by some rare disease. This is a company uh, based out of Switzerland called Volvo we're working in partnership with to bring some of their technology into genuine clinical practice. And there you here are two examples uh, on the side of rare diseases that they're working with Sanofi, the pharmaceutical company. And the idea being that we need to try and spot people who've got these rare conditions as quickly as possible. Treatments for some of these rare conditions do exist, but if we're going to improve quality of life and extend life expectancy, we need to spot these quickly. So, um, in this situation, we can push away from the state of the art to incredibly accurate um, algorithms to spot the groups of 20, 30, 40 people who should be referred to an expert clinician then for diagnosis to try and spot that rare condition very, very quickly. Shifting away from clinical, they've all been clinical examples. I just want to give you an example of how machine learning can work in, a, in the operational sense. And this was work um, 
that we did to try and optimise, this is work in the UK, that we were trying to optimise the journeys of nurses around rural areas. So nurses who were performing home visits, maybe for, uh, you know, for maternal visits or for uh, post-discharge support, for diabetes support, for people who need care in the community. And before we used data and we used technology to solve the problem, that meant a nurse sitting down and trying to coordinate hundreds, if not thousands of nurses across an area, getting the right person to the right patient with the right skill set in the most efficient way with the right route for the car, et cetera. It's an incredibly complex problem. But the machine, of course, is very, very good at this. So this is a, an expanded, sort of multi-dimensional version of the traditional traveling salesman problem. How do I pe you know, get people around the, the geography in the, the most efficient way, but with those clinical layers on top of it, which means you need the electronic health record. You need to know what conditions people have got. You need to know what skill sets nurses have. The, outshot, the upshot of this, sorry, was that by putting that technology in place, that algorithm in place, we increased face-to-face -face contact time between nurses and patients by 40%, from 31% to 71%. It's an absolutely massive impact on nurses and patients. Uh, better sat staff satisfaction, better patient satisfaction as well. Nobody was left on the waiting list. Everybody was getting treated at the right time just because of this technology. Which segues, me, segues nicely, those examples segue nicely into trusted research environments. Because there's, there's two things are true here. I think we all think it's vitally important, and lots of patients think it's vitally important that their data is used for good and to, 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 to deliver better healthcare and to allow us to, to create, uh, to use the data to do research, do some analytics, and actually improve the system. But at the same time, you know, people expect their data to be handled exceptionally responsibly. We need to be anonymizing data, aggregating data. We need to use levels of security, which means people can trust the healthcare system. And I just want to give you an, ex an example of where that's going. So this was at the start of the, um, the pandemic, um, and we were asked by the UK government and the Chief uh, Scientific Advisor and Chief Medical Officer in the UK uh, to work with the University of Oxford, and the Bennett Institute and Ben Goldacre, Professor Ben Goldacre's team, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And the question was, can we build an incredibly secure analytics platform for COVID-19 research for EMR data? Can we do it at scale? Can we do it exceptionally quickly and exceptionally securely? And over a six week period, um, we've built, and I'll show you in a second, this is all available open source for your own, uh, for any database, uh, if you'd like to use it in your own institutions. We built a platform that allows you to do this. So this meant the epidemiologists um, and the analysts in both the universities and the NHS could dial in to answer really important uh, questions, running analytics on tens of millions of records with all the primary care data, secondary care data, immunization data, testing data, so an incredibly rich data source whilst everyone was locked down and they were able to do this from home effectively from their own institutions because we built it with new security layers and made it absolutely and utterly watertight that no one was accessing any information. What it meant was we could answer really important questions, both domestically for the UK, but actually more importantly, internationally. So I go back to that thing of, you know, we've got to make the analytics work for people. And some of the big questions at the time were things like, you know, who should we be, you know, who was most at risk from COVID, from poor outcomes for COVID? Who should we be shielding, for example? Um, our first analysis was published six weeks, was, was completed six weeks after we built the platform. It was published in Nature. And we still think it's the largest COVID-19 study on electronic health record data done any, anywhere, covering 17 million people. And we were able to show definitively that, you know, what were the high risk conditions? If you were diabetic, if you had chronic kidney disease, if you were living in socially deprived areas, who were the people most at risk from an evidence base? So that could inform policy uh, around the world and certainly did. We then went on, of course, to be able to answer more and more important questions because we'd built that platform that enabled you to do that. So, of course, there were questions, if you think back to the start of the pandemic, there was anecdotally, should we be, was ibuprofen associated with worse outcomes over paracetamol? In the UK, if you went to a supermarket, you could get all the ibuprofen you wanted, but absolutely no paracetamol. But we were able to prove from the data source that definitively that's not true. It was safe to keep using paracetamol. And these are questions that mattered to people in their everyday lives. Other questions we were able to answer, these were all published in a, ser a series of papers in The Lancet. Um, should asthmatic people and people living with COPD continue to use inhalers? Was it safe to do so? The answer was yes. Did hydroxychloroquine, you know, famously Donald Trump's uh, wonder drug for COVID, if you were using that um, uh, already, if you were on that drug uh, for prophylactic reasons, did it help? No, it didn't. It's not a treatment for COVID. What were the ethnic differences? What were the impacts on people living with HIV? So we could answer all of these questions. And when you've built this resource, it allows you to do this. As the pandemic moved on, we were able to provide the government with basically real-time vaccination reports. Who was being immunized? 
but breaking it down by clinical risk group. So how, how are the heart failure patients across the entire country doing in terms of immunization uptake? How are we doing in different communities? And you can see here, uh, this was informing the media um, on a, I mean, it's kind of cool when you've got the media watching your GitHub repository um, to be able to publish, to say that we have got a gap here between uh, white, South Asian and black people living in the UK in terms of vaccination up uptake. And what that could do was, in, and that's the, the actionable thing, was to inform policy and to make sure that we were acting on that data. So the, the, the outputs of that were things like uh, webinars from community leaders to explain that there was misinformation around the safety about vaccinations. It meant setting up vaccination centres in places of worship, uh, in mosques and other areas in, in, uh, throughout the community to try and close that gap. And of course, we could, we could see that gap closing every day because we had that analytics platform. So what we built there was a, is a secure, trusted research environment, as I said, that works um, you know, on massive, massive data scale gives you all the power you need, but doesn't compromise that privacy balance. If anyone would like to talk about this and to talk about partnership of how to, to use this Open Safely platform, um, or wants to put it on top of their own uh, database across a hospital group or even a, a, a national data set, then the code's all available. We've made it all that open source so you can place it on top and run it. Please just speak to me and I'll point you in the right direction. It also, across all that work, it made us think about novel data sources. And actually, electronic health records for some of this are kind of, certainly for machine learning, are classed as novel data sources still in some sectors because of the focus on, on uh, imaging. But beyond that, we saw new novel data sources that we knew we needed to collect. And I think these have got a really powerful impact for the future of analytics. And the three I want to focus on are citizen data, collecting data directly from citizens and combining it with electronic health record data, text, um, talking to someone on the stand very recently about how much of their clinical information is still encoded in text rather than being structured. And as the minister said yesterday, genomic information. Again, thinking about the pandemic, um, where we then turned our machine learning, you know, the, the sort of infrastructure that we developed for those, uh, for looking at long-term conditions and ovarian cancer diagnosis, we turned that machine onto, uh, onto helping with the pandemic as soon as it, as soon as it hit. And we realized very quickly that lots of the information was locked in text that if we wanted to try and get, you know, and it's just to AJ's point, that really quick streaming data, the quicker we could get it, the quicker we could act on it. It was in textual information rather than testing information. At that time, it was in test, test, uh, text information rather than diagnostic or coded symptom data at the time. So we used uh, natural language processing techniques, machine learning techniques that weren't really available until a few years ago. And we were able to do that on, again, on this massive data set of, you know, tens of millions of records to be able to put an algorithm in place which could spot from textual data, from textual symptom data, exactly when outbreaks were happening and where they were. And we were able to provide that to government and to local government so they could start to act on that in exact geographies. So if I give you an example, we could see at one point, you know, immediately there was a blip in a certain city in the country where we were seeing lots, a, a, a sharp rise in the symptoms in text associated with, uh, with a COVID diagnosis. And then we were able to see that that was in an area, an industrial area with lots of factories working in the textile industry. And it meant that a public health team could get on the ground and start to you know, impose the, 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 the sanitation measures and the lockdown measures on that population where we wouldn't have known that before if we hadn't had that really quick data. And then the same technique allowed us to spot patterns for new symptoms. So for example, we saw very strongly the loss of uh, um, uh, taste, loss of sense of taste and loss of sense of smell in the data just by using that same technique. Suddenly it was a symptom that was being recorded in text that had not been there before. So it gave us a new way of saying, we're identifying emerging symptoms for a problem. Um, we can start to inform public health authorities about how they can use that to adjust case definitions, for example. And you can imagine how powerful that is for the next pandemic, where the symptoms won't be the same, but we've now got a machine which will allow us to spot the new symptoms. And you can imagine if we go back to the cancer example, where symptom information is absolutely king, but lots of it will be in text, how we can use this textual, this process to extract that information and get better and better algorithms. The citizen data, I think we all see the value of that for things like long-term condition management, to be able to, to ask patients questions about how they're performing, and to be able to do some remote monitoring around blood glucose monitoring in COVID for things like pulse oximetry monitoring. That idea of being able to push things out at a patient level and collect that data is, is going to be vital for analytics over the next few years. Just as an example, one of the things, of course, now the world is, is, is starting to, 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 to con be concerned about and health systems are concerned about is the burden of 
of long COVID, people who were living with you know, COVID symptoms, say 12 plus weeks from their diagnosis and, and what the impact of that is going to be. Using that data, so we're working, this is with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. They're taking the data, so they're taking our app. So we have a smartphone app that links directly to the EMR, uh, which millions of people already use. They're taking that app, they're using that to collect quality of life information for patients who have declared that they're uh, living with long COVID. That's going straight into the electronic medical record so that the doctors can see it, should they want to, but then also straight into that open safely research database so that they can do the analysis. So we've now got a new route directly for patients to collect information that you would never traditionally get your hands on. And the applications for that, we think are absolutely enormous. You can just think about how you could use that in a cancer diagnosis situation, how you could use that uh, for post-surgical discharge support, for example. And then finally, on novel data, and the health minister raised this yesterday, the 10,000 Genomes Project here in Indonesia, is you know, one of joining a really good list of, of biobank projects around the world. So in the UK, we have UK Biobank, where we have 500,000 people um, who have their genome sequenced, and we've linked that to TPP's data, their, their electronic health record data, to try and give new opportunities for analysis. If I give you an example here, this is Stanford University, uh, using, that, so using that TPP EHR data combined with the genome sequence data, the bioengineering department, to do some really interesting pharmacogenetic work. So looking at how genetic variation in patients can, can lead to different variability in drug responses and then ultimately influence pres prescribing decision support, but using routinely collected EHR data to be able to do this. So some of their results have been able to, to show Yes, we do have you know, different optimal doses for people with different uh, genomic profiles. Some of that's backing up existing evidence, but moving it away from just a small cohort research study into the real world where we're seeing it, but also seeing novel associations that weren't there before, that you know, then moving to more research and more investigation. Similarly, we're seeing examples in, in their work for side effects that, that, that people didn't know about, novel side effects of drugs that we can get just by combining these things. So we're going to get far better prescribing decision support systems just by linking this data, meaning people are getting safer treatments, better treatments, and they're not having treatments that are causing them you know, discomfort in their lives and, and unnecessary side effects. And I want to finish just by talking about actionable analytics, because going back to the thing I said at the start, if this isn't empowering the workforce, if it's not delivering better, safer care, then all of this work is for absolutely nothing. And I just want to give you an example of how we do this. Uh, and, and this is just, this is from The Lancet, this, this month, um, it's from eClinical Medicine in the Lancet. Um, and I was reading this uh, brilliant piece of work which is around uh, a predictive risk model uh, for women living with gestational diabetes and the risk of them having an adverse pregnancy outcome. It's coordinated uh, in Australia and has, uh, it's very, very relevant to an Asian population, for example, it has parameters that take in different ethnicities across the region. And the thing is, how would you, you know, the, the, the danger is that this languishes in a journal for far too long. This is a really good piece of work, but to get your vendor to put this into a clinical system, an EMR system, via a request for change, for example, how, do you, how is that ever going to become something that influences uh, actual clinical practice? And the way we do that is via exposing a no-code development platform with this functionality. So we call this the clinical development kit. And what the CDK allows, people, allows doctors and nurses to do is to create everything from data entry uh, templates to screens and visualizations, uh, analytic reports, for example. In this example, they can create their own user-defined clinical decision support. So they can create that in the system using a range of uh, you know, complex mathematical tools if you want to put an algorithm in, and then they can use that in their clinical practice. More than that, they can share that, at, say, across a hospital group. They can share it across the entire system nationally if they want. They can put it in, we have something like an app store effectively. They can put that algorithm in an app store and people can rate it with a star rating and comment on it. And then if you're using the system and you want to input, uh, to use one of these tools, you can just pull it down and have your copy running there in your hospital group. So rather than having to ring up your vendor and say, will you please put this in, which is never going to work, this is a scalable approach to allowing people. So that could be in now in, in hospital settings, in community settings, in low resource settings you know, improving uh, the quality of maternal care for women living with gestational diabetes just because of that product. As another example of being actionable, again, putting things in the system that allow, don't be too prescriptive around how you, you know, put analytics back into the system. So this is work we did with NHS England, University of Leeds and University of Birmingham about six years ago, uh, where we were asked to develop an algorithm which could predict 
uh, which patients were most frail in the community, which elderly patients were most likely to have uh, uh, an adverse health outcome just because they got a UTI or had a fall that they'd end up in hospital and then have a poor sort of trajectory of healthcare from then on, you know, rather than it being a really expensive, complex, uh, comprehensive geriatric assessment. And we could do that work, and the work was actually set up to try and help primary care doctors in their elderly care management, and it became part, it's still part of uh, the NHS's uh, elderly care management um, requirements as part of the contract. However, what we didn't expect but by leaving it flexible was that the surgeons and the oncologists would, would like this algorithm in place because it enabled them to, to make, say for the oncologist, to make treatment decisions alongside their patient based not on someone's chronological age, but based on an analytic indicator of how frail they were and how likely they were to, 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 to benefit from that treatment. And then at the same time, the health economists, who we didn't expect, started to use that analytic algorithm to model people. Who were the most expensive? And it turns out the people that the algorithm identifies as frail are the highest cost service users. So if we can target those service users and stop them going up the frailty trajectory, we can actually reduce the overall costs of healthcare. So it was win-win across many different facets of the healthcare estate. And very, very finally, uh, this is a pathway that's been developed right now, which brings some of these things together and kind of wraps up what I'm trying to say, which is an algorithm developed uh, by the University of Leeds machine learning algorithm to try and help spot uh, people who are living with atrial fibrillation but ha don't have a diagnosis of that. So the idea is you're taking that rich electronic medical record, you apply the algorithm to it, and, and that breaks you into two categories. People are at higher risk of having undiagnosed AF, people at lower risk. At lower risk on the bottom, you can see people drop into routine care. If they're at higher risk, they're invited for an appointment uh, into their GP practice. They then move to digital rhythm, rhythm monitoring at home using smart technology. And then you either get an AF diagnosis or not an AF diagnosis. If you don't have one, drop into routine care. If you do, go onto an AF pathway, which means going into the hospital. So it's kind of that end-to-end -end idea of using machine learning, using electronic health record data and smart technology to develop new pathways uh, for better diagnosis of, of important conditions. What does that mean for us as an analytics community? Well, I, the HIMSS uh, analytics model here, I think is absolutely fantastic. And I think it takes you through uh, it takes organizations through a great journey of, of how you start from basic analytics up to predictive and prescriptive analytics. But I just think we've got, and I think a real opportunity for the HIMS, new HIMSS Indonesia analytics community is to think about, we can't take our eye off this. This isn't a static list. We need to think about where this list goes sideways and where we need to support some of those different stages with things like a no-code development platform that allow you to, to action these things and even goes upwards into new levels. So the idea of uh, being able to move analytics to the patient, being able to run machine learning across tens of millions of patients. This kind of idea of we need to, 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 to keep building on this thing and year by year thinking what are the metrics we want uh, if we're going to improve analytics and bring analytics to clinicians, doctors and patients. So thank you very much.